My brother and I were driving along through the mountains of Tajikistan, you know, as one does, and Drew pointed to this rocky path leading down from the main road and said, let's pull off here so we could take a picture of our car in the middle of this field. Now, if you're a longtime listener to this podcast, you've probably gathered by now that I tend to be the more cautious one, while Drew has a tendency to be a bit more, I don't know, cavalier? Anyway, I was afraid we'd get stuck, so I told him I didn't think it was such a good idea, but he was like, oh, don't worry. So he got his photos, but then... I know you're recording me. Of course I am. And I'm probably not going to make it up the hill this time, but that's okay. What's your plan B? Jane's going to get up the hill. Jane knows how to drive stick. We clearly don't. Okay. He stepped on the gas, trying to make it back up the incline. You're digging yourself in. You're on, like, sand here. We made it a few feet, but the car didn't have the power to go any farther. I noted that it was getting steeper and rockier. But once you have the momentum, (laughs) here, just push me. (laughs) Jane came over and offered to give it a shot, so we got out to help. Okay, we're pushing it up. We're making progress. Almost, almost, almost. So close! But she couldn't get it all the way either. Just then, some local guys who happened to be driving by stopped to marvel at this ridiculous scene of the stupid Americans who'd gotten their car stuck on the rocks. <laughs> After we explained our situation, three of them pitched in, and between all of us, we finally got the car back onto the road. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, that's all it took. It was just another day on the Mongol Rally. Famous last words, this would make a great photo. (laughs) It's hilarious. I'm Scott Gurian. I'm a longtime public radio and print reporter, and I've created this podcast called Far From Home to document the unexpected adventures and chance encounters I have with interesting people around the world. To start off, I'm telling the story of a massive road trip my brother and I took with our friends raising money for charity. We drove nearly 11,000 miles. 11,000? That's right, a quarter of the way around the Earth, from London to Mongolia, through 18 countries, eight time zones, five mountain ranges, and a few deserts, in a ridiculously tiny car. It's like the Beverly Hillbillies. It's not for the faint of heart. It's the adventure, isn't it? It's just the thing of pushing yourself to the absolute limit, because I think it's going to take us out of our comfort zone, but in a really good way. If you're just joining me, I suggest you first go back and listen to all the previous episodes in order to get up to speed and for all of this to make a bit more sense. From language barriers to car trouble, getting horribly lost to paying bribes to shady traffic cops, it's been quite an amazing experience and over the coming episodes I'll be bringing all of you along with me for the ride. So Drew and I were driving on these rocky roads along the Afghan border, and as we kept climbing higher, the scenery around us became more like a moonscape. Flat terrain, sloping hills all around us. High mountain terrain, there's no greenery at all. It's more of a tree line. Yeah, there's just nothing up here. It's just uh, very desolate. At one point, it seemed like we reached a bit of a plateau, so I told him to shift gears. Put it in third gear for a change, give the engine a little bit of rest while we can. Poor thing. Uh, let's hang it in there. Not to jinx anything, but this car has far outperformed any expectations I think any of us could have had. Oh, yeah. I mean, the idea of going on the Palmer Highway that we're on right now, I don't think any of us quite knew if we could physically make it. But then, as we began climbing again, pushing our car to work harder and harder, our temperature gauge also continued to rise until we came close to overheating. So we pulled over to let things cool down a bit. So we are on this dirt and gravel path, and we're starting to see a lot more snow-capped peaks now. Up in the distance, beautiful blue sky with some clouds. We're about the only ones around. We occasionally see another vehicle passing us in the other direction, almost always a 4x4. We're the only fools taking one-liter vehicles on a road like this at this kind of altitude. And, the steepness and everything. We are at 4,100 meters, which is how many feet, Drew? 13,400 feet. Okay, we're yeah, more, more than two miles high. I don't think it gets too much higher than this yeah. today. Yeah. No, it doesn't. I think, no. I hope it goes down a bit, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've skied it 
twelve and a half thousand yeah, feet. Yeah, I know. We were but just left lower. Yeah. When you sleep at that altitude, that's the tough part, and that's oh, I think yeah. when you get the altitude sickness and all that. That's what they say. I mean, altitude sickness, you can be fine one instance yeah. and really crap the next. So. Absolutely. I'd read up on this before we left, and technically, the experts say you're supposed to pace yourself at these sorts of heights, so you don't ascend more than 500 meters a day. Or if you do, you should descend again by nightfall, so you don't end up sleeping at a much higher elevation than where you started. The problem was, the road we were on kept climbing higher, and we were trying to go as far as possible to make up for the time we'd lost waiting for our car repairs in Uzbekistan. So we decided to keep going when normally we probably should have stopped. Complicating matters was the fact that when we were planning our route, we thought we'd be able to make it past the highest point of the mountains and partially down the other side by nightfall. But now it was getting late in the day, and we hadn't made as much progress as we had hoped. You see, not only were the roads in pretty poor condition, but our little cars were really slow at climbing. So we were starting to realize that the GPS estimates we'd been using to judge how much time it would take us to get from point A to point B were so overly optimistic that it was laughable. I mean, it was so bad that on this particular day we were on the road for nearly 12 hours, stopping only a few times to switch drivers or get gas, and we only made it 130 miles, or an average of 11 miles per hour. So, we're pretty high up now, and uh, a little bit out of breath. I was feeling a little bit of pressure before, and uh, I guess my jaw and my head. My brother and I are taking some medication to prevent altitude sickness but we've still gone up quite a bit today. To be precise, we were now over 7,000 feet higher than where we had woken up, which was more than four times the 500 meter daily limit, but our options at this point were limited. It's about quarter to six here. The sun's getting low in the sky, and we're totally in the middle of nowhere. So we found a little turn off off the main road. We have no idea where it leads, but I guess it gives us a bit of privacy and safety. So, I don't know, we camp out here, it's a little bit flatter. It seemed as good of a place as any, so we parked our cars and began setting up our tents. As the sun set, it started to get pretty cold. We saw a bicyclist uh, that we passed uh, just a little bit down the road. His name is Gus, he's from the UK, and we took pity on him because it was just such a difficult path for him on this road. It was very sandy and lots of pebbles going up the incline. He was going very slow, and plus he's been doing this big long bicycle trip, and his camping stove broke down last night, so he doesn't have any way to cook his food. So we invited him to join us for the night. Plus we're so remote to the extent that there's safety in numbers. We figured it would be good if he could join us here. So he's come along with us, he set up his tent, and uh, we parked our cars kind of in a V. And we also strung up a tarp to shield some of the wind. We're boiling some water for some pasta. I'm gonna eat shortly, and then I just can't wait to hop into my sleeping bag for the night and uh, stay in there until the morning. Hopefully it'll be a little warmer in the morning. Um, kind of missing <laughs> 100 degree temperatures in Iran now, but... Uh, that's what we signed up for on the trip. It ended up being a pretty uncomfortable night. You see, we'd checked the weather before leaving on our trip, and the overnight lows didn't seem too bad, but it turned out we were looking at forecasts for towns that were in the general area, but at much lower elevations where the temperature was warmer. Suffice to say, we never expected it to get quite as cold as it did. Even bundled up in five layers of clothing, I was a bit chilly. And for Rosie and Jane, who had much thinner sleeping bags, the situation was so bad that they returned to their car in the middle of the night in a futile attempt to stay warm. On top of that, several of us got pretty bad altitude sickness, so we slept poorly and suffered through the night feeling really awful. I saw Rosie early the following morning. Jane got a terrible headache. We both got really bad headaches. We both taken headache tablets. Jane walked over. Though it had warmed up a bit, she was still shivering. This couldn't have been far of freezing last night. No, it was very cold. I just Thank could you. not get warm. No. My feet were cold the whole time. My whole upper body, I was just chilled with the core. Yeah. We're just not prepared for this kind of camping. Yeah. Aren't you glad that we didn't go ahead with our plan to go to the Arctic? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pack up and get the hell out of here. Absolutely. <laughs> We all survived, that was the main thing. I knew we would survive. 
Of course. We've survived to fight another day, as they say. We said goodbye to Gus, threw all our gear back in our cars, and we're about to get going once again, but you'll never guess what happened next. No, no, no! If you've been listening to this podcast from the beginning and you think all these stories of our car troubles are starting to get tiring, just imagine what it was like for us, stranded in the middle of nowhere yet again. First, we tried push starting it. It's just nothing. It's not even trying to kick no. in. Can we try jumping the battery? We can put the jump leads on it easily enough. But that didn't work either. No. Nothing at all. It, it could be something with the spark plugs. So then we looked into that. Remember, none of us knew much about cars, but the last mechanic we visited in Dushanbe had given Drew some instructions. They can get clogged with oil. Okay. Spark plugs because of our oil leak issue. Yeah. Because of the incompetent mechanic who rebuilt our engine. These are the engine coils. Then how do you get the spark plug out? With this nifty tool. So what do you do? You take them out and you clean them off or something? <laughs> we'll see in a minute. <laughs> okay, I have no idea what we're doing. But with his socket wrench kit, he looked convincing. You're looking almost right. professional. Right. Hang on, I think I need my camera here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a bad idea just to replace them all. Let's see if it does anything. <laughs> it was a valiant attempt, but it didn't seem to make a difference. We'd done all we could to troubleshoot. Now we were stuck, and my brother and I couldn't rely on Rosie and Jane to get us out of this one. It was too steep for them to tow us all the way back up the hill, so Jane and I stayed behind while Drew and Rosie went to try to find help. So what we decided, what are we doing now? They're going up onto the main road to um, see if they can flag a four-wheel drive down to go and pull us up there. Sorry our car's been holding you up the whole trip. Yeah. Yeah. One of those things that could have just as easily been ours. Yeah. I scanned the horizon. Sandy hills stretched as far as I could see in all directions. Aside from an occasional gentle breeze, it was remarkably quiet, and there was no one out there but the four of us. Well, it's quarter after nine. I mean, we're quite a distance from the nearest town, so if anyone was coming on this road, if they're setting out from whatever the nearest big town is, it would take them a few hours to get out mm. this far, so they wouldn't be here too early in the morning. Time seemed to be moving really slow. We've been waiting at the side of the road for over an hour now, and not a single car or truck has passed in that entire time. So we're, we're definitely out there in the wilderness. At least the sun is out. It's warmed up quite a bit out here, so it's not so freezing like it was last night. So, you know, we've got that going for us. But we still really would like to get out of here and be on our way. I got my hopes up momentarily when another vehicle did finally come along, but after chatting with the driver, Drew radioed back the bad news. These guys in the truck, they're obviously going the opposite direction, and they can't back that monstrous truck down and, and tow us out or anything with what they have. So I think they said that they're going to go forward and try to call somebody for us, but I don't really know. Okay. Well, at least if they could call someone for us, that could help. After another hour went by without us seeing any other signs of life, Rosie and Jane decided to tow our car as far as they could to the edge of the embankment, and then all of us continued to wait. It was frustrating because the road was right there, about 100 feet ahead of us, but we had no way of making it up the incline. I don't think we can push, to be honest. You know those lads we saw yesterday? You need those. You need four strapping lads. We've you... got no grip on here at all. We're at risk of really hurting ourselves. You'd think someone would have come by now, right? It's crazy. Well, okay, have you got plenty of water? We oh. have a lot of water. And have you got food? No, you haven't, because the boxes of food are in our car. So let's take some of the food out. I hate to... to say this. What's up? Well, I think we have to plan for the worst case scenario, which might be that you end up camping here again tonight. Yeah. yeah. Of course, after our miserable experience the previous night, that was definitely something we hoped to avoid. I was just starting to strategize in my mind how to fend off vultures when I saw a minivan full of people heading towards us up the road. Rosie stood in the middle, comically waving a bright red t-shirt to make sure she got their attention. 
They pulled over, and as Drew started to explain our situation to them, we noticed several more vehicles coming in our direction. <laughs> We've been waiting two hours, and then all of a sudden, a minivan, a 4x4, and a tractor trailer all come up at once. <laughs> it turned out they were mostly guests returning home from a nearby wedding. And remember those strapping lads Jane said we needed? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven men. Between seven of us, I would hope we should be able to push it. But who needs brute strength when you've got a four by four with a tow rope? Oh, is he going to try to pull us? Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. See, they know how to do it. They're putting rocks under the wheels. Go back. Go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there we were, at long last, back on the main road. Hey. Hey. <sighs> Our car was still unable to start, but as Rosie remarked, at least we were in a better place than we'd been an hour ago. We started chatting with one woman in the group who spoke some English. Where would be the closest Is there a mechanic place? this way, close or no? We're trying to think where the closest mechanic would be. 40 kilometers. Which was about 25 miles. To, uh, to, to Alichur. Alichur. How is the road this way? Between huh? here and Alichur. How is the road between here and Alichur? Is it very bumpy or is it is paved? It a bit. Big mountain or no? No, 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 big no. mountain, no. Okay, let me just break in here and say that listening back to this now, it reminds me of when you ask the waiter in the Indian restaurant whether a particular dish is spicy, and he says, no, not really. So then you order it, and your mouth is on fire for the rest of the night. Okay, back to the tape. Is the road good enough for that car to tow this one all the way? Munkun, munkun, bo makinase, bo ish. Evet? He says yes. We thanked the people for their help, said goodbye, and watched them drive away. Then Rosie and Jane attached the line to our car and started pulling us once again, but we didn't make it very far. We just snapped our tow rope. <laughs> We got out of our cars to assess the situation. After inspecting the broken tow rope, I set to work mending the two ends back together. Rosie complimented me on my tying skills. That's a good knot. That's a bowl in. Oh, is it? It's one of three knots I remember from Boy Scouts. Mm. My scoutmaster, Mr. Hughes, would be proud of me. Can I just pull that through now? I suppose you could. Is that it? That's it, yes. The rabbit comes up from the hole, goes around the tree, and goes back this. down the hole. I remember that. You remember yeah, when you Girl Scouts? Yeah. They actually asked me to leave because it was a disruptive influence. They asked you to leave? The, what'd you do? I don't know. They said it was a disruptive influence. I have no idea what they were I can't about. imagine why. No, I can't. So, we've got the new tow rope on now, and we're being pulled down a very dusty, gravelly, bumpy, pothole-bladed road to the next closest town, Alichur, where we're hoping to find a mechanic. Just to set the scene, our car was maybe six feet behind Rosie and Jane's, so my brother, who was behind the wheel, had to keep his eyes on their bumper and constantly keep his foot near the brake, since there'd be very little reaction time to keep us from ramming into them if they had to suddenly stop. What's more, we had to watch for their hand signals, as they'd tell us a second or so before they had to swerve left or right to avoid giant holes in the road. The whole thing would have been hard enough under normal circumstances, but was made even more difficult by the fact that their car was kicking up giant clouds of dust, so we had very little visibility. Basically, it was like playing level 10 of some really challenging high-stakes video game. This is not an ideal road to be towed on. <laughs> It was a vast understatement. <laughs> As I hinted earlier, this road was also much hillier than we'd been led to believe. And the only way Rosie and Jane's car would have the power to tow us up a hill was if we picked up speed on a flat stretch so we had some momentum as we started to climb. But picking up speed was difficult with all the bumps, since potholes had a tendency to sneak up on us, and we didn't want to add to our troubles by screwing up either of our car's suspensions. Somehow we made it up and over one decent sized hill, but then as we started to climb a second, even larger one, both of our cars started to slow. Oh, come on, let's keep going. Little engine that could. Oh, but eventually we couldn't go any farther. Slowly. Uh, no, that's about it. We're about halfway up. 
yeah. Well, I don't know what we do. We certainly can't push it. Jane got out of her car and walked over to us, shaking her head. Got the power to get you up. You got the power to get us up. I think this is where you guys leave us and see what you can find in town. If we leave the tow rope with you, if you see a four before, get them to pull you over. If we see a four before coming the other way, we'll come back with it. Yeah, I guess. Remember, the woman from the wedding party had told us it was about 25 miles to the next town, but we'd only made it four, so there was still a long way to go. Rosie and Jane said goodbye and drove on ahead, leaving Drew and me to ponder our fate. I suppose there's worse places to break down. There's not that many I can think of. I mean, despite the cold, I, I would rather be broken down here than in the desert of Iran. Oh yeah, yeah. There's more people there though. Yeah, pretty remote here. We could be broken down in a war zone somewhere. Yeah, this is true. We stood on the bare hillside overlooking a giant valley of sand, rocks, and weeds. There wasn't a single tree in sight, just a lone power line along the road and some steep mountains off in the distance. It felt like we were the last people on Earth. I swear, I thought I heard voices from somewhere, and I guess it's just the sound of the wind. It's like I'm becoming delusional waiting out here. Crazy. The wind was starting to pick up, so we got back in the car to stay warm. Is this what you thought when we signed up for the Mongol rally? You think we'd end up like this? <laughs> I expected something would go wrong. I had no idea what, but I figured we'd probably be broken down somewhere. I didn't know here. So are your expectations being fulfilled right now? <sighs> yes, I suppose so. You've been saying all along you wanted more of a challenge, more of an adventure. So here we are. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would put being broken down under the adventure category. I think camping last night does go under there, but I mean, this is just part of it all, though, I suppose. Out of all the places we could have been broken down, though, we are surely the most remote that we have been on the entire rally so far. It took two hours of waiting before another vehicle finally came our way and we flagged it to the side. Four young Tajik guys hopped out, and through a mixture of hand signals and the few English words they knew, we explained to them that we needed a tow. They at first asked for a hundred bucks, which seemed like a terribly high amount, even though it was the opposite direction from where they were heading. But after some negotiation, we managed to talk them down to seventy, along with the promise to give them our beaded seat cushions once we arrived. An hour or so later, we made it to the tiny town of Alichur, where we reunited with Rosie and Jane and found a local mechanic to look at our engine. He'd barely started to troubleshoot when the miraculous happened. That is ridiculous. <laughs> that is so ridiculous. <laughs> I wonder how much that charges. <laughs> we tried jump starting it and everything, we didn't we? We changed all the spark plugs. We tried push starting it. We tried yeah. jumping it. Yeah. The only thing that had changed was that we were now at a slightly lower altitude than we'd been earlier, but we didn't know why that might make a difference. We watched the mechanic drive off in our car. He's going to take it for a test drive now. Hi. Look at it. See you. Look at it. It's going like a bomb. But that makes me really concerned because it's working fine now, but I don't have faith in it one bit. And you're right not to have faith in it a bit. Not after that little episode. Oh, for heaven's sake. Though the car was running once again, it was clear there were still problems. Even on his short test drive, the mechanic said it stalled a couple of times. And when he started it again after he got back, it seemed like it was struggling. It doesn't sound good. It has no energy at all. After spending a few more minutes looking under the hood, he gave us his expert diagnosis. Motor no good. It's no good. He did say he thought we could probably get to the next town, Murgab. To Murgab it's good. And then? <laughs> and then? And then? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. He speculated that perhaps we could even make it another hundred miles. But beyond that, he didn't have much hope. 
He also didn't have the parts or the expertise to fix it there, and even if he did, we didn't really have the time to spend another week stuck at a garage to get a proper repair. What was the alternative, though? We'd gone all day without eating anything, and we were starving by this point, so the mechanic walked us over to a local restaurant. The only thing they had was this greasy fried fish with lots of bones, but it would have to do. As we waited for the food to arrive, we continued discussing our situation. So, what are you thinking? I have no idea. I'm just trying to think if we have any options to keep going. Um, You're not prepared to invest the time in the car, Rosie asked? If we find a good garage that we know can fix it, but then again, is how much more is it going to cost? Also, we've put so much money into it already, I don't know. It's a lot of money for a car we're not going to keep. I turned to the mechanic. What would you do? Maybe go in Mordovia in the taxi. Taxi to Mongolia the rest of the way? <laughs> <sighs> in all seriousness, our situation seemed pretty hopeless. I feel like we've done all we can do, you know? We were all feeling pretty worn down. Even Drew, who in the midst of our head gasket problems a week earlier, had said he was determined to finish this journey no matter what, was now ready to concede defeat. If it you were know? just me and my decision alone, yeah. I would scrap the car. I would scrap the car and go home. We briefly entertained the possibility of splitting up, so if Drew and I had to drop out, Rosie and Jane would continue and finish on their own. You know, you're in the rally just as we are. If you wanted to go on without us, I'd love to give you two the opportunity to carry on. You know, you've helped us out so much already. I mean, I don't look at it as helping you out. I mean, we were a unit, the four of us. Yeah. We are a unit. It just wouldn't be the same without us, she said. Jane agreed, adding that she was worried about what would happen if her and Rosie's car started having problems and they ended up breaking down without my brother and me there to help them out. Drew took out his cell phone and called the mechanic we'd used in Dushanbe to get his take on what we should do. A few minutes later, he reported back on the advice he'd received. He says if we try to drive it now and go any distance that it could do more damage, that could be irreversible. And he's saying basically what he would suggest would be to get a flatbed tow truck to the border because they'll find much better mechanics in Kyrgyzstan. The problem was there simply weren't any flatbed tow trucks in this tiny town. And even if we could find one, it was sure to be expensive. Drew was defiant. I mean, we're not towing it to the border from here. We're going to start spending a lot of money just to get it to a place to get diagnosed. We just have to go into this knowing very well that we may break down on the way. We might which will suck, but we don't really have a choice in the matter, right? Rosie wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. Are we all agreed we leave here now? We um, have no choice. What are we going to do here? Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. That's what I sort of think. There's nothing that can be done here. No, anyway, no. Let's go and okay. just kind of see what happens. I mean, we have to try. Visit my website at farfromhomepodcast.org to see some more photos my brother took from our journey along the Afghan border and through the mountains of Tajikistan. It's such a beautiful part of the world. It was probably the prettiest country we went to on our entire trip. So if you ever get a chance to go, I highly recommend it. Just take my advice and drive a better car than we did. If you're interested in finding out more about how I produce this show behind the scenes, I've also posted the link to the latest Tascam Capture Your Art podcast where I was a guest. Next time on Far From Home, the road keeps climbing and we reach the highest point of our journey. Yesterday, I did not think that we would be standing here today. We're on top of the world. We are on top of the world. <laughs> but our ongoing car troubles give us more doubts that we'll be able to complete the rally. I just don't know if it's realistic to think that we could finish it with the four of us. As much as we want to, it doesn't seem like it. Thanks as always to Katie McGee, Louis Campana, and Drew Gurian for editorial assistance, as well as the Public Radio Exchange for podcast hosting and technical support. If you're looking for more cool podcasts tailored for your listening tastes, you should check out the Radio Public app in Google Play or the Apple App Store. And if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please spread the word to your friends on social media and take just a quick moment to leave me a rating or review in iTunes or the Apple Podcast app because it really does help. 
Until next time, thanks for listening. Slow down a little here. This is really bad. At least it's kind of cave. Kind of, sort of. This is so much better than the roads earlier. Yeah, but there's like a bump every five feet. I don't know. Oh, that's a big bump. Oh, no. Big bump. Yeah, watch out. I can just like right in another one. Ah, sorry. True. We have enough issues with this car. <laughs>